Hey, there we go. Camera's on again. All right, time for me once again to slide back in front of the camera. Hi, I'm Frank Hubble, and welcome back to the Wilderness First Responder course. This is the second video, and this video is all about the world of infectious disease and body substance isolation, which explains why I'm wearing the gloves, the mask, the glasses, and a hat and stuff too. So in this day and age, with the risk of infectious diseases such as coronavirus, every single patient that we see and we handle and we manage, we have to protect ourselves from them. And that's what this is all about. And so that's what we're gonna talk about over the next two videos is gonna be the world of infectious disease. So I just, I wanna start out this way, but let's get rid of this stuff so you can actually see my face and see, see my lips as they're moving. And again, get rid of these gloves here. There, excellent. All right, so again, I'm Frank Hubble, and this is Solo's Wilderness First Responder course. Second video, this is all about infectious disease and body substance isolation. Um, all right, so the world of infectious disease. The world of infectious disease and our concern about it over time has changed. When I first started out, when I first became a paramedic back in the early 70s, and for the next, oh, 10 to 15 years, when we responded to emergencies, we didn't put on gloves. We didn't put on a mask or, or, or eyewear, or eye shields or anything for protection. We just showed up in our fancy jumpsuits and went to work. And quite often we showed up in the emergency room after a, after a bad car accident, absolutely covered with blood. Or we would do CPR on someone and we didn't were concerned about the airway or our airway. We did mouth to mouth resuscitation uh, and we took a chance. We sort of had a bit of a false belief that because we were out there taking care of other people that we sort of had this uh, um, guardian angel that protected us. Well, it wasn't necessarily true. The thing that changed though was HIV. Along come HIV AIDS <clears throat> and we realized it's a bloodborne pathogen and you not only is the sexually transmitted disease, you can also get it from somebody else's blood. And our concern became hands. Your, your skin is bug proof. You know, viruses and bacteria can't migrate in through your skin. But the problem with our hands is all around the cuticles and our fingernail beds, there can be little small wounds and we can have blisters and minor abrasions and all sorts of little things can happen to our hands. That can be the way for that individual's blood, if we get in our hands to get into our body and then whatever disease they have, we have. And that can be hepatitis B, that can be HIV. <clears throat> so that was our first great concern. So we started wearing gloves. We didn't like it and our patients didn't like it, but it was, an, it was an important thing to do. Then along comes SARS and MERS and Ebola and viral influenza type A and B and coronavirus, COVID-19. And these things can be spread through coughing and sneezing in the airway. And so it became really important to now protect our airway but also we can absorb these things from our mucous membranes so we had to protect our eyes. And we're gonna talk about all of that. So things have changed. So today, when we see patients for whatever reason, we protect ourselves. We're wearing our, our surgical mask, our N95s, or our cravat or something over our face. We're wearing some sort of sunglasses or eyeglasses or, say, or, or safety glasses, some sort of shield to protect our eyes. We've got our gloves on. And if I'm dealing with somebody who is coughing, sneezing, wheezing, carrying on, or if they're bleeding, we also wear a waterproof garment to protect ourselves. So if anything gets coughed onto or sneezed onto us, again, it can't get into our clothing, and we're finished, we can take it off and dispose of it. All right, so that's the introduction. That's why this is important, and it's profoundly important. And throughout the course, we're gonna be practicing these skills from day one to the very end, the end of the program. So it becomes part of, of, of how we do things. All right, so what I would like to do, I'd like to back up and I wanna talk a little bit more about the world of infectious disease. With all of our lectures you're gonna go through, all of our solo programs, we do not teach uh, um, a list of things to do if A happens to do B. Instead, we always talk about the underlying anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, so you know the whys, and it becomes common sense as to what, what sort of things we do. All right, so here's our, our little form. Hopefully I didn't just slide completely out of camera. If I did, oh well, just it'll be just a voice in the distance. So a disease, what is a disease? Um, it is an, an, an a interruption, alteration, or cessation of normal body functions, or a system, or an organ. So something's happened to the body, a disease process. Diseases have a recognizable set of symptoms. So it affects certain parts of the body. So we can tell by those symptoms, the fever, the chills, the chest pain, the cough, the reductive cough, all these different things, exactly what's going on. So it has an identifiable collection of signs and symptoms and consistent uh, anatomical alterations. So therefore it allows us to make a diagnosis, to know how to treat it properly, and then as the person improves, 
those alterations go away. In the case of an infectious disease, that's, that's a disease process that results directly from some sort of microbiological agent, whether it's coronavirus, which causes, it affects the respiratory epithelium, causes the coughing, you know, and the pneumonias, <clears throat> you know, or a tuberculosis, which causes a respiratory infection. Then, a, a, a term you commonly hear is a pathogen. A pathogen is a microbe, a microorganism that is capable of causing disease. So there are pathogenic microorganisms and there are non-pathogenic microorganisms. In our world, we're obviously concerned about the pathogens. Then there's the world of communicable diseases. What that means is that disease can be communicated from one person to the next. So using um, um, viruses, influenza viruses, for example, there's an avian flu out there, a bird flu. And if you're working with ducks or chickens or geese and they happen to get bird flu, you can actually get the bird flu from the birds. But it went from a bird to you, but it isn't transmitted from human to human. So you'll get sick and you will recover, but you can't spread the disease to other people. What happened recently in the case of the coronavirus is it kind of went from a bat to a human being and the human got sick. Unfortunately, it also was, it was communicable to another human being, it was contagious. So, that, so one person is able to spread it to another. So that's what we mean by a communicable disease. It can be spread from person to person. And that's where we need to be careful, is that when we're never manage anybody, you know, sick or injured, we need to make sure that we protect ourselves from any possible communicable disease. All right, so a few more terminology that you're gonna hear a lot. We, so infectious disease, how are they transmitted? They're transmitted by a vector. So, so it's a method by which the infectious disease is transmitted, and it can be food, water, insects, get a cough, sneezes, etc. So mosquitoes, um, they can, they're a vector of malaria. They can transmit malaria from one person to another. A person with a common cold can sneeze or cough, blow it out into the air, and then you inhale it, and that cough or sneeze became the vector. That's how it's transmitted. Uh, food, water, and we're gonna, we're gonna look at these vectors in detail in, in a minute. So vectors, how it's transmitted. Then there's a reservoir. The reservoir is, is, a, is a living or non-living material where the, where the infectious disease lives in nature. So like the bats, bats have coronavirus. They're a reservoir for coronavirus. Doesn't necessarily hurt or kill the bat, but, the, but that's where it is. Armadillos, oddly enough, are the, the reservoir in nature for leprosy, for Hansen's disease. <clears throat> so there can be a, a reservoir in nature. Case of malaria, no other animal gets but humans. So humans are the reservoir for malaria. Then there's something called a host. The host, the organism in which an infection agent lives and is dependent on for energy. So and when you get that disease in your system, it's now living in you, you are now hosting it. It's able to multiply in you and get energy from you. So you're the host. Then there's three different types of relationships in the world of infectious disease. There's something called symbiosis. That's where one microorganism lives in another, but both benefit from it. Oddly enough, we have bacteria that live in our intestinal tract. That bacteria benefits from living in us because we feed it and we keep it warm and happy. Uh, but in the process, they also elaborate things like vitamins, like vitamin K that we need to survive and thrive. So there's a benefit to both. Then there's a par parasitic relationship. That's where one organism lives in another, but at the cost of the other. So one organism benefits from living in it, the other one does not, it makes the other one sick. And then there's commensal. And then commensal is where one organism lives inside the other at the benefit of it, but it causes no harm to the other. <clears throat> so, so it gets a free ride, but it doesn't cause any harm. All right, so some terms, a few more terms. So now let's look closer at the modes of transmission. How are infectious diseases transmitted? The first one slipped to theirs, you know, airborne. That means it gets somehow into the air. So the person's coughing or sneezing. Um, you know, carrying on the process, they blow the infectious process out of the atmosphere. And so there you are, if they cough and sneeze around you and you're within, you know, the six feet of the person, and you then take a breath, you can inhale that, that infectious particle, that pathogen into your lungs, and then it went from their lungs to your lungs, and now you've got the infectious disease. Then it's gonna be a period of time, at which point the, the, it begins to reduce within your system and it starts to cause, it cause symptoms. You know, the, how long that takes for that to occur. So that's airborne. Uh, a good example, you might be on a crowded bus or um, a crowded train somewhere around the world and, and people might have something like tuberculosis and if they're coughing or on, on that train and say cough, they blow the tuberculosis bacteria out into the air. If you're in the same space and you inhale it, you've now sucked it in and now you've got tuberculosis. That's how you get tuberculosis. 
Airborne, one of the most common ways that diseases are spread around the world. And that's why we're trying to teach people when you cough or sneeze, cough or sneeze into your elbow, prevent it from blowing out into the universe, or get your hands up in front of your face, or a cravat, or, or a handkerchief, or something. Try to minimize it being blown out into the atmosphere. All right, then there's a direct contact. And we mentioned that earlier, like with HIV, bloodborne pathogens. So any body substance, any fluid that belongs inside the body is a potential carrier for pathogens. So therefore we protect ourselves from all body substances. We do not want to come in, in direct contact with blood or saliva or sweat or tears or urine or feces or semen or vascular secretions, anything. Any fluid that belongs inside the body that's now gotten outside the body, we want to keep it off of us. That's why we wear the protective gear. That's why we wear the gloves. That's why we wash our hands, etc. So we want to avoid that direct contact. Then there's indirect contact. This is another really common way that people pass on infectious disease so they get it. So the person has a cold and they cough like crazy. They've now coughed that cold germs, viruses into their hand. Then they walk along and they come up to a doorknob and they grab hold of the doorknob and they turn it, they open up and they, they leave or they go somewhere. You come along five minutes later, grab the same doorknob and open it up. In the process now, whatever viruses or germs or microbes that person planted on that doorknob is now on your hand. Now again, you're not absorbing it through your hands. Your hands are bug proof. The problem is so if, so if, if in a relatively you know, short amount of time, you use some hand sanitizer, you wash your hands, you get rid of those microbes. The problem is, once you have it on your hands, you can't go from hands to face. Because when you touch your face, you take those microbes, and if they get on your mucous membranes, your lips, your, 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 your gums, your mouth, the nares of your nose, or up around your eyes and stuff too, those infectious, those microorganisms can be absorbed directly through the mucous membranes. So, and so we need to avoid that. So indirect contact. So a solid object that gets planted on is called a fomite. So these services, so it can be a surface, a pen or a pencil, anything all the fomite. So it goes from their dirty hands to your dirty hands and then your dirty hands to your face. Um, so you learn if you're working around patients and you're writing stuff down on a chart, writing things out, that pen never goes behind your ear, never goes in your mouth. Because whatever's on your hands is on that pen and now you've transferred it to yourself. So you have to develop all these habits of nothing goes in your hands and mouth. And that's one of the benefits of wearing our little surgical mask is when I have this on, it becomes much more difficult for me to touch my mouth to pass things on. So it's a, it's a reminder. When you kind of do, you go, oh, I'm not supposed to be doing that. And the same thing with the glasses. I can't get at my eyes, you know, to rub my eyes. Then there's the insect born. I mentioned that. Things like mos mosquitoes, ticks, black flies. These blood-sucking insects can spread disease from an animal you know, a reservoir in nature, like Lyme disease from the, from the black-footed mouse and from white deer, you know, white-tailed deer to us. Um, the mosquitoes from person to person in the case of malaria. And then last but not least, food and water born. Um, what, you, what we eat and what we drink. And then it says fecal oral transmission, that's kind of the whole point, is from their butt to your mouth. So without good hygiene, you know, if you'll go to the bathroom, they don't wash your hands, and they're out preparing food, handling food, whatever, they can pass on whatever they, ha they have to the food. So food and water born can pass on all sorts of diarrheal illnesses, hepatitis, hepatitis B, things of that nature. All right, so what do we do? Body substance isolation. Airway, 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 cover your airway. That can be a surgical mask, it can be an N95, it can be a cravat, it can be a bandana. It can be anything at all, it just kind of covers your airway and protects it so that anything you have, you can't cough out on the person, what they have can't get to you. And when we're dealing with patients, if a patient has a fever, chill, sore throat, cough, <laughs> wheezing, sneezing, carrying on, we put a mask on them as well. So, they, so now their airway's isolated. So as they cough and carry on, they can't blow it out in the atmosphere. The face, so this part of the face where there's our eyes and our nose and mouth, we call that the T-zone. So we keep our hands off of our T-zone and it takes practice. Uh, and then like in the classroom, you'll be watching each other and if you see somebody got their gloves on and they're working on a patient, they rub their eyes, you need to speak to them and say, don't do that. You know, you, you have to learn, it takes practice. Hands, uh, cover your hands, you wear your gloves. We use hand sanitizer. Wash your hands. There's really nothing better than washing your hands, but it takes time. It takes 20 seconds to kind of wash your hands, scrub them all up. But washing your hands, soap and water, there's nothing better than that. If we can't, don't have time, we can't do it, then using the hand sanitizer, rubbing that into place. And then last but not least, are the garments. So there's waterproof, splash-proof gowns that we wear to protect us, you know, from, from any body substance, you know, whether, whether it's blood that could get on us or saliva, urine or feces, or if the person's coughing. 
You know, that's the other layer of protection we put on over our clothing. And then when we finish examining the patient, then we take all the stuff off. We, we, we strip the garment off, we turn it inside out with our gloves still on, then we turn our gloves inside out. You know, we're really careful how we take stuff off so we don't cross-contaminate ourselves. And then we immediately, you know, dispose of that appropriately and then wash our, wash our hands. So just a little bit of humor here. I thought this was great fun. I love this guy improvising a face mask with a big old leaf of cabbage or something. Uh, somebody pointed out to me that cabbage is a natural antimicrobial compounds in it. I'm kind of, well, maybe knows more than I do. But some of these other ones I thought were very clever. You know, the, the orange rind with the hole poked in it, or this person's taking a water bottle, you know, cut the bottom out, put it over his head. Here's a grapefruit guy. He's amazing. He covers him out of the grapefruit. This person also has a water bottle, but they've attached to it other devices to protect him. This person has a water bottle, looks like Darth Vader, with water bottles attached to it. And then there's this character here with a head, sort of head of lettuce over his head. The only problem is, he exposed his eyes and his mouth, so it really didn't do him a lot of good. But yeah, they're creative, they're thinking through the process. So you, you know, you can't blame them for trying. All right, then there's the world of infectious disease, and we're gonna talk about this. The world of the pathogens. We go from prions to viruses to bacteria, fungal infections, mycotic infections, and finally helminth, the parasitic worms. It's a lot more than you necessarily need to know, but it's important stuff, and I wanna walk through it again so you're really well educated. That's gonna be in the next video, right? So this first one, this is all about us. This is all about ourselves, protecting ourselves, understanding the world of infectious disease out there and how if I don't wanna get tuberculosis, if I don't wanna get Ebola, if I don't wanna get the coronavirus, then I have to wear my protective equipment. And it works, you know, I've been managing many, 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 many sick patients over the last couple months with, with the coronavirus. Uh, potentially with it, and none of my staff, none of us have gotten ill, but that's because we're very dedicated about this stuff. Um, the other thing too is we haven't been seeing patients inside. Anybody who's been sick had to stay outside in their car in the parking lot, and we examine them outside to keep our, our urgent care centers you know, as free of these diseases as possible. So these are all little things to think about. So now in the class, as we walk through the process of doing patient exams and, and putting on bandages and, and splitting each other up, we're gonna be doing all